Hey everyone, welcome and thanks for tuning in. This episode is sponsored by DECRA and features Dr. Joel Griffies here to talk about topical therapy for our dermatology patients. The more I learn about antibiotics, the better understanding I gain of the pros and cons, the risks and benefits, and mostly just the importance of good judgment when reaching for antibiotics. With infections like MRSP and other resistant bacteria on the rise, it's increasingly important to find ways to manage chronic or recurrent infections in ways that limit the development of further resistance. Enter topical skin therapy. Lucky us, when it comes to skin conditions, many of our medications can be applied directly to the problem area, which all sounds great, but with so many options, how do we decide which product to reach for? I'm in general practice, so I treat a lot of skin, and I loved getting to ask Dr. Griffey's all of my burning questions about the differences in topical therapies and how to use them most effectively. He has a very clinically applicable approach, and I felt like I learned a lot from him. I hope you do too. Dr. Joel Griffey's is a 1992 graduate of Auburn University's College of Veterinary Medicine. After graduation, he worked in a small animal emergency practice for seven years in Metro Atlanta, Georgia. In 1994, he began a small animal practice in Lawrenceville, Georgia, where he developed a love for dermatology and a need to learn more. In 1999, he relocated to Southern California to begin a residency with Animal Dermatology Clinic. Dr. Griffey's completed his residency in 2001 and became a shareholder of Animal Dermatology Clinic shortly thereafter and has been an integral part of Animal Dermatology Clinic since. Dr. Griffey's is a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Dermatology and co-owner and member of the Executive Board for Animal Dermatology Clinic. Dr. Griffey's has lectured at a variety of veterinary conferences and meetings locally, regionally, and nationally. In 2010, he moved from California back to the Southeast and is a senior dermatologist at Animal Dermatology Clinic Marietta in the Metro Atlanta area. Dr. Griffey's, welcome back to the Southeast. We're happy to have you back. His areas of special interest include topical therapies, endocrinopathies, and allergic dermatitis. Let's go ahead and jump in. Well, for this episode, I am joined by Dr. Joel Griffey's, and we're going to talk about topical skin therapy. And I have to tell you, Dr. Griffey's, the more I learn about antimicrobial resistance, the more I really feel like I lean into topical skin therapy. So I, I'm really, I'm interested in this talk, but I'm also a little bit intimidated. Like I'm hoping I'm doing this right and I'm choosing yeah. the right topical skin therapies. You bet. No, it, it can be certainly uh, super challenging. And I think, you know, the more and more we see these, uh, the methicillin resistant staph in particular used to be something you'd see, you know, once a blue moon and, and now it's multiple times per week. Uh, and so, oh, yeah. uh, you know, with that being true, then, yeah, I think we've all had to kind of take a step back and, and refocus on our approach and, you know, what makes the most sense so that we try and and manage the tough ones that we have, uh, but also maybe try and avoid propagating that as much in the future. Yeah. So I think, you know, that probably actually answers this first question I have, but just kind of talking about the importance of topical skin therapy, you know, we're talking about antimicrobial resistance, which is a scary thing, but sure. are there other reasons that uh, topical skin therapy is important? Yeah, you bet. Well, first of all, I mean, thanks for, for having me and, and talking about this, because I, I do think topical therapy in general, even this many years down the road when we've all been talking about it, topical therapy is still an, a very underutilized uh, type of therapy that we have. And I don't know if that's, uh, you know, the people don't realize how beneficial it can be or um, just still are, are stuck in that, in that adage of we shouldn't be doing this very often or, uh, or what. But, you know, topical therapy can be an absolutely huge uh, player in our overall treatment protocols. Um, things that we think of, of course, first line, by all means, infections. And, and, you know, that really is still the lion's share of the topical therapies that we use in our dermatology practice uh, is helping to manage whether it's routine infections or super challenging infections, as you mentioned. 
But, you know, other types of things that really benefit. I mean, let's face it, the skin is on the outside of the body. So uh, unlike, uh, you know, lots of other specialists, we have access to our organ that we're treating, which is super helpful. So, you know, we can do things like clean it up in the cases of uh, infections, but we can also do things like manage itchiness better and manage inflammation better through topical therapies. And then, of course, we can't forget the greasy and crusty dogs. So, you know, that's another category where topical therapy is absolutely huge. And, and really, you almost can't do it without topical therapies in some of these types of cases. Yes, absolutely. There were a couple of things that I heard in what you were talking about just there. One of them was when you said the skin's on the outside of the body, so we have access to the organ. Like I got this picture in my head of like an internist squeezing a gallbladder. Right, right. I was like, okay, back on track. Back on track. If, if only they had things where they could get to them, right? Exactly, exactly. The other thing that you mentioned right there in the beginning was the concern of, are we going to do this too much? And I think in a lot of the recent information that I'm aware of, we've kind of gotten away from that overbathing concern and said, as long as you have a good quality shampoo, you're probably okay. Is that right? Yeah. So overall, you know, the, the answer is if we're using the right things, we don't need to be worried at all. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, 30, 40 years ago, we all kind of uh, were, were taught this notion of you shouldn't bathe a dog very often. And, you know, hopefully by now, a, a lot of folks have seen the research and understand that that just isn't the case in dogs with skin disease. You know, for normal dogs, fine, bathe them as often as you want or as often as you feel like you need to. But for dogs with skin disease, uh, not only is it not a bad thing, but it can be incredibly beneficial to bathe and bathe frequently if we're using the right products. And that's where really the difference is huge. You know, if we're using the right products matched to the right problem or the right disease, you know, topical therapy can be an absolutely huge benefit. And you mentioned, you said some of these disease states, we can't get, we can't treat them without topical therapy. So can you elaborate on those a little bit and talk about the types of skin diseases that can appropriately be managed with topical therapy? Yeah, you bet. So when we talk about um, infections, as you uh, mentioned before, especially our uh, methicillin resistant staph, that's the first one that comes to mind. But you know, sometimes you culture these infections that have been persistent, they've been on multiple antibiotics, and you may culture them and get back a result that might as well say good luck across the top of it, because there are either no antibiotics at all that are going to be effective according to that culture, or the antibiotics, the one or two that might be listed are ones that really you have to consider pros and cons because sometimes they have the potential for harmful side effects. So in those cases, if we can have folks doing topical therapy and in particular frequent bathing, frequent application of antimicrobials, can, you know, products containing chlorhexidine, there are some of these dogs that uh, come back looking like a million bucks in a really short period of time. And so, you know, methicillin resistant staph, it's not uncommon for me to say, okay, this has really been a challenging problem. I'd like to see you bathing this dog every day for the first five, seven, 10 days or so. I mean, usually it's only five to seven. And then once they're doing better, we start backing off. We go two to three times a week. And then after a week or so of that, we might, you know, twice a week, once a week, and it goes down from there. But frequent bathing can make a huge difference in infections. The other big one that you think about are these really greasy, crusty dogs. Um, the old term that nobody uses anymore, uh, Seborrhea oleosa. So that was the term that you used to hear for the for the greasy dog. And, uh, uh, you know, with the products that we have and, and the right ingredients, those dogs, you know, the average greasy, itchy dog gets a lot better with regular bathing, um, as does, you know, a lot of our crusted dogs. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of things where we've got these types of abnormalities on the skin, especially if we know what we're treating, then, the, you know, topical therapies are huge. So. You said something that really piqued my curiosity. Can we dive into the nitty gritty for just a minute? Absolutely. I love that. Okay, so we're talking about methicillin resistant staff. First of all, if anybody from any of the labs is listening, I would really love it if I would get my culture back with good luck at the top. It would make me feel just slightly more <laughs> optimistic about the result there. So, you know, maybe if we can add that to our, our lab reports there. But thinking about this methicillin resistant staff, and I may be completely off on this, but the resistance mechanism for staph 
is a plasmid, correct? So they can swim around in these antimicrobials and just not be affected by them. So is the mechanism for bathing there, you're essentially just washing the bacteria off of the dog? Yeah, so a couple of things involved there. I mean, certainly the mechanical removal of a lot of the extra debris that that our bacteria are, you know, swimming around and having a great time, that's helpful. But, uh, it, you know, those, those mechanisms of resistance largely apply to our antimicrobials, you know, our, our antibiotics. And so uh, when you look at chlorhexidine, for example, the incidence of resistance to chlorhexidine is very, very low. You have to really go delving into some human literature to find anything that suggests that maybe there are a few cases of chlorhexidine resistance. The other product that you think of as far as antimicrobial effect is benzoyl peroxide. And benzoyl peroxide is different even than chlorhexidine in that it's, it is more of a physical reaction, the release of peroxide that helps to kill the bacteria. And that's a mechanism that resistance isn't really even possible. And so, you know, you've got those two products that I think compared to antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic, the chances of resistance from doing that are even lower. And so it would be pretty uncommon. Interesting. Thank you so much for diving into that with me. I was, when you said it, I was like, oh, I have to know. Yeah. Do you foresee like resistance to chlorhexidine? Like, will that become more of a thing or is, is it just such a high concentration? Now I'm asking you to look into your crystal crystal ball. Yeah, we well, exactly. You know, who, who knows what's coming along? Uh, you know, if, <laughs> if, if we can see that, boy, we can, we can develop products uh, just in the right time when they were needed, right? Who knows? I mean, chlorhexidine has been around for decades, right? And yeah. it still is by far the number one antibacterial product that we use in topicals for management of skin disease in, in animals. And so, yes, I mean, percentage of chlorhexidine, there are you know, some good studies. Uh, those are, are, are fairly you know, older studies at this point because they made a really great point. And what was found, uh, I believe a study in 1999, that uh, 4% chlorhexidine is capable of killing staph uh, you know, in, in those days, it was even before the change to staph pseudo-intermediates, to staph intermediates at that point, but capable of killing staph, uh, I believe, in one study in less than a minute uh, contact time and at 2% in, uh, in in three to four minutes. So, there, you know, there, there's a really good track record of chlorhexidine working against our most common pathogen. At three and four percent, it's also been found that chlorhexidine has some antifungal properties, so it can help us eliminate yeast uh, like malassezia that we see often. Now, don't uh, take away from that that I'm saying you treat dermatophytes with only chlorhexidine bathing because I don't necessarily do that myself. But is it a great adjunctive to help us along the way? Sure, you bet. But, uh, you know, chlorhexidine been around for a long time. There isn't resistance yet. Might that happen in the future? Maybe. Um, uh, who knows? Uh, but maybe by then we'll somebody will come out with something better. Well, I appreciate you letting me kind of take us off the rails there and, yeah, and really put you on the spot. <laughs> that's OK. No, uh, you know, that, that's how we kind of think about doing new things and, and figuring out the best way to to uh, to manage these things. Absolutely. Well, while we're talking about chlorhexidine and you mentioned the benzoyl peroxide, which that's very exciting to know that it, it would be very difficult for bacteria to, to develop a resistance mechanism to that. Let's kind of let's dive into that a little bit of the different products. How do you know which product to choose for each different disease state? Yeah, I mean, honestly, thank you for asking that question, because ultimately, our best success is when we're using the right product that's matched to the right disease. And, and that's something I try to talk to veterinarians about anytime we're talking about, about topical therapy, because probably one of the best examples that I deal with routinely is an itchy dog that walks into your practice that's doing some licking, scratching, chewing, what have you. Maybe it's a little bit greasy. And because it's itchy, it might be tempting to use an anti-itchy type of shampoo. And whether that's something with a little bit of, uh, you know, 1% hydrocortisone or some of the other kind of soothing ingredients. But if we look at that dog and we don't kind of go that next step of saying, well, these areas are a little greasy or a little, you know, we've got papules, we've got crust, whatever, and, and do some impression smear cytology. Because if we find on that case 
that there are loads of bacteria here or loads of yeast there, well, our, our approach changes in our topical. And that one quick little five minute test is the difference between really good help and no difference at all. Because if you take the dog that, let's say your average basset hound that's covered with yeast as they like to be, and you do some cytology and you see, yep, sure enough, there are a bunch of yeast there, and you use a, a combination myconazole chlorhexidine shampoo, that owner should be able to tell you, yes, it makes a difference when I use this product. If instead we were to use something that's supposed to be soothing or just anti-itchy, you might get a reply back that eh, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So choosing the right product based on what you know about its effect and, and that product's ability matched to what disease you're treating it is really what makes the biggest difference. And I can see that in clinical practice being hugely important. I mean, my dog is 66 pounds. I weighed him the other day. I know yeah. he's exactly 66 pounds. Right. And he loves the bath and not in a good way. Like he's going to dance and he's going to wag his tail and he's going to jump around. And if you told me to bathe him multiple times a week and then it didn't work, I right. would not be the happiest person yeah. in the world. Yeah. And, and, and we all know they're not all quite as happy about getting yes. in the bath and you know there are stories of, of people dragging them in there or they somehow see the the dog towels and go running or uh all, all kinds of escape routes so i get Absolutely. it yeah. So know what you're treating. I think that's great advice to make sure that we're choosing the right product because we're aware of what is causing the problem with our patient. And so once we figure out what we're treating, you've talked about the uh, myconosol, chlorhexidine. What about like, like when do we choose benzoyl peroxide or um, it, there's like the sulfur salicylic acid? You bet. So yeah, those are our, our big ingredients that are still kind of the, the big players in, uh, in shampoos that we use for topical therapy. So chlorhexidine, obviously our, our, our best antibacterial, um, sometimes antifungal at three and 4%. Myconazole, also ketoconazole that we'll see uh, in, uh, in some of the antifungal antibacterial combinations. Benzoyl peroxide is one that the place that I put it in is kind of combination of effects. On the one hand, if for some reason you can't use chlorhexidine, benzoyl peroxide is usually my second line antibacterial. But the other properties are where we use benzoyl peroxide more often, which is it tends to be a good degreaser. Um, it's uh, keratolytic, which means it helps to remove some of the extra keratin, you know, crust and extra kind of piled up layers on the surface of the skin. And the other kind of claim to fame that it's had for years um, is a talk about it being follicular flushing. So if you've got a bunch of impacted hair follicles in cases like Demodex or sebaceous adenitis, then it's talked about as having an ability to help break up that material that's clogging up those follicles and really liberate that uh, and be able to rinse it off. So benzoyl peroxide, then when you add sulfur and salicylic acid, and you, most often you'll find those two together. So sulfur and salicylic acid, and then usually it's, you know, most products that have them, just a handful, are going to be with a benzoyl peroxide. Uh, I don't know if it's still around, but there used to be one that was chlorhexidine and sulfur salicylic acid. But most of them, probably best example of that is something like dermabenz, is going to be benzoyl peroxide combined with sulfur and salicylic acid. And what you get from the sulfur and salicylic acid is just that extra oomph, a, a, a really a significant level up in all of those properties. So in degreasing, in keratolytic activity, really removing lots of crust and greasiness on the surface. It also has talked about that combination, the, the sulfur component, as being keratoplastic. Now, keratoplastic means that it slows down the overall epidermal turnover rate. So uh, for all of us that have skin, skin is constantly reproduced, right? So there's the basal cell layer of the epidermis. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, those, the cells are produced there. And then they move up as they mature. And then we get all the way to the stratum corneum. Eventually, they flake off into the world. And that process just continues. When we've got dogs... For example, the really crusty uh, uh, cocker spaniel that has primary idiopathic seborrhea. 
So those dogs have lots of little crusted plaques all over and they look like they might be infectious, but you get a cytology of those, you even might even biopsy those and you don't really find that many bacteria or you treat them with antibiotics and they just don't get that much better. They get some better because there's often bacteria on top of that, but you remove the bacteria, they're still crusted. When you use a shampoo like a combination benzoyl peroxide, sulfur salicylic acid, not only does it help remove those crusts, but that keratoplastic effect is supposed to help slow down the overproduction of skin cells that results in all of those crusted plaques. So may maybe too much of a long-winded answer to talk about those ingredients, but that's one of the really important features of those ingredients that I think, uh, I think it's important to know. No, I am i don't think it was a long-winded answer at all. You had my attention the whole time of going, okay, and then we add this and then we add that. Yeah. Is there any reason not to add the sulfur and salicylic acid? Like, is it drying? Is it going to cause any issues? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So ultimately, yes, with the more aggressive anti-seborrheic, the more aggressive keratolytic, keratoplastic effects, you bet drying is absolutely a concern. And so when you've got that benzoyl peroxide, which can be a little bit drying, depending on the percentage of benzoyl peroxide, that can be drying on its own. And you add the others in, then you bet you definitely have a concern. And that's, you know, when I talk about bathing daily for an infection, it would almost never be with a benzoyl peroxide sulfur salicylic acid uh, combination. Now, if you've got the really greasy dog or the crusted cocker spaniel doing that type of shampoo once a week, yeah, for a, given, for a given patient, you might get away with that. For your average allergic dog, probably wouldn't be using that combination if they're just mildly greasy. I'd probably go a little bit more conservative on that uh, because sure, I mean, it can be a, a little bit dry, a little bit too abrasive. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering about that and that answers my question perfectly and I feel like I can take that straight into practice. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about ingredients, especially while we're talking about drying, you know, you hear about these other ingredients. You hear about ceramides or phytos, I can say it, phytosphygnosine. Uh, did I say that right? Yeah, you bet. Close enough. <laughs> All right. What, what are we looking at with those? What, you know, what's, what do they do? What's the application there? Sure. What's the point? So, you know, some of the, uh, the research studies in the last uh, several years have found that, especially with our atopic dogs, uh, much like atopic people, their epidermal barrier isn't the same. And there's a great electron microscope study a number of years ago that had uh, a, a great photomicrograph of a normal dog and one of an atopic dog. And they even, you know, to the, to the naked eye, to an untrained observer, you can tell one is very organized with lots of lipid layers. And, you know, you can understand how that would be multiple layers of protection. And the other one looked like a broken down brick wall. I mean, it really with, without all of those. And so, you know, that's where the addition of some of the ceramides, um, you'll get some great products with fatty acids like linoleic acid. And those components have been shown to be pretty critical in the formation of what's referred to as the cornified cell envelope. So that's just what all of those skin cells flatten out and create combined with fatty acids and ceramides uh, in order to be more protective. And whether that's protective from bacteria and yeast or, you know, it's, it's more waterproof or it kind of is a physical barrier to keep allergens from penetrating the epidermis further. You know, the reason a lot of our atopic dogs current understanding is really these guys are as much of a barrier defect as anything else. And if it weren't for that barrier defect, then the immune system of the epidermis and the dermis below would never really be alerted to all of the allergens that they react to. So that becomes important. So if we are adding ceramides, there's another good study where there was a concentrated topical ceramide applied topically to dogs. And then the electron microscopy repeated that showed, hey, there is a difference. And so, you know, clinically, if we can add ceramides to products, even like shampoos and fatty acids to shampoos, for these dogs that are deficient in those, clinically, it really does translate to a difference. And so whether it's your average, just itchy, slightly dry allergic dog that you use a product that's a, you know, a good quality shampoo also with linoleic acid added, or it's an antimicrobial antifungal where you've got, you know, your chlorhexidine myconazole, but you've also got ceramides and fatty acids added to that. It really does seem to make a big difference. And that's where, you know, I believe the difference in 
being able to not only survive daily bathing, but thrive with daily bathing, I believe has a lot to do with how those products are formulated and the addition of some of those other components. And so it sounds like, based on what you're saying, that all dogs with skin disease can benefit from these ceramides, not necessarily just the atopic dogs. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Although if you've got a dog with a with a full complement of its ceramides and fatty acids and a totally normal epidermis, are you going to see as much of a difference there? Maybe not. But I, I certainly don't think you would harm any of them with them. And if you're considering your, your practice inventory and you don't want to have tons of different products, well, erring on the side of one that has those extra components, I think is a great idea. I love this. Like good practical advice. We can just yeah. take it straight out of this talk and right back into practice. Great. That's what we're after. Something I am curious about, I've never done it myself, but I've heard of people doing this and I've been really curious, especially, you know, as we get these good luck cultures back and things like that is the use of bleach to treat skin disease. Is is that a thing? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it, it, it is a thing, believe it or not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because as you stand in an exam room and, uh, and you first mention applying diluted bleach to somebody's dog. It's kind of fun after a while to just kind of throw it out there and watch for a reaction <laughs> because, you know, you get some people that are like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know, if it, if it helps and, and, and others that uh, couldn't possibly fathom that, you know, this crazy person standing in front of them would want them to apply diluted bleach to their baby. But it really is a, a legit thing. And there are, uh, I believe at last count, five or six different well-performed studies looking at a couple of things. One is the ability of diluted bleach. I mean, I always tell people at the outset pretty quickly, we're not talking about opening the cap and pouring the concentrated bleach on don't your do dog. That. Okay, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Probably would cause some irritation. But diluted bleach has been well studied. And, and the initial studies there were looking at, hey, you know, what concentration does it take? What dilution of regular off-the-shelf bleach does it take to kill the common pathogens that we see on the skin? So our you know, staff, both methicillin sensitive and resistant, pretty important, pseudomonas, uh, malassezia, the common yeast that we see. And so there are those studies that have certainly been done in vitro. And then there are, uh, there are a couple of other studies looking at overall tolerance. And in one of those studies, diluted bleach was applied and then a biopsy performed later. And you know, one of the big concerns I think that a lot of people have is, isn't that going to be an irritant? Isn't that gonna cause you know, inflammation? Will it burn? I mean, what other things are gonna happen? And in general, um, first of all, clinically, when we talk to people who have done it, we don't find that any of that occurs in the overwhelming majority of cases. And then from that research study, it, was, uh, it actually showed a slight decrease in inflammation. So we don't have a lot of concerns overall. Now, I always tell people, obviously, don't get it in their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, don't, don't, if they lick it, it, you don't have to rush to call poison control. But, uh, you know, obviously, don't let them drink a lot of it and, you know, that type of thing. So, but beyond that, it really can be a very useful tool. And the, you know, the types of cases that we use uh, diluted bleach for are usually the hard ones. You know, they are those ones where you get the really challenging culture um, that you've tried multiple antibiotics, you find that some methicillin resistant staph, you're really struggling, you know, routine bathing alone isn't managing. It. And so I will um, typically have people use a dilution uh, of bleach. Now there are a few variations of diluted bleach. The one that I typically use is a one to 20 uh, dilution. It's one to 20 or one to 32. So it's about half a cup of bleach per gallon of water. So it really isn't that much. It's important to fill your gallon jug with water first, because otherwise, as you do that, it foams up and goes everywhere. Um, and uh, the most important thing, in my opinion, in using that is just really the degree of thorough application. Um, over the years, I've had folks that have said, well, can I put it in a spray bottle and spray it on? And for the first few, few years I was doing this, I said, sure, why not? As long as you get it on there, no big deal. Um, just remake the, uh, the bleach fairly often, um, you know, every day, every other day, whatever, if we're doing that frequently. What I've found over the years, though, is that most of the folks that are doing a spray version, it just doesn't work as well. And my impression of that is that 
especially in dogs with hair, which most of them have, right? Or at least we hope they get back. I mean, um, they are coming I, to see dermatology, so that, 50, that's 50. right. So it, it could, could, be, could go either way, right? So, you know, in our dogs, I feel like people don't spray enough. And so they may get the surface of the hair and, oh yeah, that feels wet, we must be done. Um, what I find, where I find it most successful is when they really are taking that gallon jug and literally pouring it over the dog and getting them sloppy wet. Um, if we're working on armpits and groin, then I have them stop up the tub if they can, take your favorite old, you know, big gulp cup and, and scoop it up and slosh it or in the armpits or grab an old wash rag and really get it just sloppy wet on those places. My protocol, I usually leave it on there for three to five minutes or so. And then we just towel dry and just kind of blot them dry. There are some folks that say, don't even do that for fear of washing it, you know, wiping it off. Let them drip dry, you know, let them go out and wander around. And that the, 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 uh, the dog walking through my house, dripping diluted bleach along the way just doesn't sound very floor friendly. But, you know, in those cases, that could be a problem. So, so that's my usual protocol. The one caveat I would say that I want to be sure to mention is that you don't want to use a leave-on chlorhexidine product or repeated use of a spray mousse foam wipe, whatever, if you've left on a diluted bleach. And the primary reason for that is just, it just really seems to cause this nasty precipitation and staining that you can't wash off. Um, and so it has to wear off over time. Um, so if I'm doing diluted bleach, still okay to bathe with chlorhexidine, rinse really well, and then we do our diluted bleach, just kind of blot dry, leave it on there until the next bath and, and, and repeat. I'm picturing like a yellow Great Pyrenees walking yeah, around. Yeah, no, that's, or... <laughs> that doesn't make you very popular. That no. Is, it is not, a, uh, is not a great thing. Yes, he's less infected, but now what do I do about my yellow dog? Yes, my yellow dog who is dripping yeah. dilute bleach across doesn't, my floor. <laughs> right, doesn't make us very popular. Used with caution, but very effective. That's right. <laughs> So talking about, you mentioned the topical formulations like a mousse or something like that. Can we dive into those a little bit more? I, I like the mousses, but, you know, again, a little intimidated by this talk. I'm like, hopefully I'm using these correctly and, and doing it the right way. Um, what are the application for those? Yeah, you bet. I mean, you know, the, the nice thing about topical therapy for our dogs is that there are a handful of companies that listen to us over the years and that have really done a fantastic job of saying, well, okay, so you say dogs don't like to get sprayed, you know, what other options can we come up with to provide the ability to apply something or to disinfect or, you know, get this topical effect on the skin. So that's been really, really cool in the last, you know, especially 10 years, maybe a little bit longer than that. The mousses are the, you know, the latest uh, product in that category and I'm with you. I love them. I think they're fantastic because, you know, it's that same kind of thing I was talking about with diluted bleach. When people apply things, I think they stop a little bit short of really rigorous or, or uh, aggressive or thorough application in some cases. And I like the idea of the mousse because if you can squish that between the toes and, you know, maybe get a little bit in face folds or tail folds of a bulldog or a, you know, or a pug or, you know, the groin or the, or the armpits. And they really seem to be a lot more readily accepted by dogs than the sprays. I mean, you know, it, it seems like, every other, maybe more, every other pet owner with a dog that you hand the spray to says, yeah, he doesn't like that very much. And they go running when you grab the spray bottle. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the mousse of the foam just gives us another method of application. The primary ingredients that you find in those similar, if not identical to many of our shampoos. So you get your chlorhexidine, you know, mousse, which is great for places of recurrent bacteria. You get the combination chlorhexidine, myconazole, you get some that may also have an anti-inflammatory ingredient in there as well, a soothing ingredient to help with our, with our itchy dogs. So yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think they're fantastic. In general, you know, I, I vary from, okay, uh, if you've got this problem, it's okay to use those every day. But in many cases, once a particular area of infection is better, then I'm looking for people to be able to cut back on that and do that you know, three times a week, twice a week, once a week, whatever. So it just, just allows that lasting leave-on application of ingredients 
without having to do the full bath over and over again or just spot treat certain areas. Yes, you mentioned more readily accepted by the pets because as soon as you said the sprays aren't accepted, the first thing that went through my head is, yeah, they grab the spray bottle and the pet goes running and then that's exactly what you said. So also more readily accepted by the owners when you say, hey, can you do this every day as opposed to, hey, can you bathe every day? Um, I feel like I get pretty good compliance in those. Yeah, you bet. Well, and and I certainly understand that we as dermatologists have a very sheltered existence. And so, <laughs> you know, the, the the folks that come into us with the dog that's uh, that's so smelly that you you walk in the exam room, decide to leave the door open. Uh, you know, th- those people are a lot more willing to say, fine, I'll bathe the, the dog every day if we can do something about this smell. Uh, but, you know, once you get a little further down the road, I think people's tolerance for that is understandably probably not forever. So if you can do that for a limited period of time, then my usual approach is, okay, let's do this to begin with. And then we transition to something that's a little more tolerable for the long term. And the better they're doing, we would hope the less often you have to do those things. But yeah, I, I do agree. I think it's a, it's a great kind of alternative. It's great to have some of these options that make it still effective, still necessary and effective, but a little more user-friendly for the, uh, for the pet parent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would love to know your process that you go through when you have a dog come in with, say, a bacterial pyoderma. Yeah, you bet. So, I mean, again, topical therapy is really, in my opinion, critical for those cases. And I don't think any case of pyoderma should ever walk out the door of anybody's practice without topical therapy being mentioned. Now, you, you mentioned the Pyrenees. If somebody has the 150 pound Pyrenees and said, yeah, nice try, I'm not bathing this dog. <laughs> I, I get it, I'm okay with that. What about a moose or a foe or, you know, let's find another way. Uh, but nobody wants uh, their animals on antibiotics forever. Uh, as we talked about at the outset, the incidence of methicillin resistant staph is not decreasing. And so part of it is this, you know, overuse of antibiotics or, or inappropriate use, inadequate use, whatever. So um, with a bacterial pyoderma, there's a difference between that first time pyoderma and the one that's recurrent or chronic all the time. With the first time pyoderma, if you've got uh, an entire body or most of the trunk being covered, I'm still probably going to treat those dogs with antibiotics if it's bad enough. If we've got focal areas, sure, I'd rather do it with topical therapy. Here, let's do some bathing for the first couple of weeks. Let's do it, you know, two to three times a week if that's reasonable and and possible. And then let's follow that with something like a topical chlorhexidine mousse so that you're doing that after each of those baths as a, you know, provide some residual antimicrobial effect. And then as time goes on, we're cutting back on the bathing and we're doing the bathing, you know, once a week for a few weeks. And I'm probably going to reevaluate them before I go less than that. Uh, So once a week, but we're still doing for as long as there's any evidence of anything there, we're still doing the topical, like a mousse spray, foam, uh, wipe, you know, something of that nature in between. How often we're doing that depends on how bad it is. It may be on average two or three times a week. Now, the dog with the chronic recurrent pyoderma, the most important thing there is that folks have to understand that when we treat your dog's pyoderma and it's got a bad underlying allergy, or maybe it's a dog that's immunocompromised by Cushing's or something else, at the end of treating that pyoderma, you have the same dog. And that same dog that's been prone to these infections over and over and over again is still prone to them no matter how good he looks at the end of our treatment. And so for us to think that this time we've gotten it really good, never to return again, it is just at that point naive. And at this point, you see the clients nodding and saying, yes, I'm tired of that train. You know, can you help me get off of it? And so that's where, you know, really we talk about let's do a lot to get them under control. Once they're under control, let's back off of it. Let's get down to what's the lowest level maintenance, but let's do that in a realistic and gradual way so that we say, okay, with once a week bathing, let's talk 
after you know a few to several weeks, whatever. Let's look it over. Uh, let's make sure that even we don't find you know the owner saying it's not infected, and you know it, we as veterinarians saying it's not infected may be different. And so let's make sure we find no remaining lesions. If we don't, maybe we scale it back further and go every two weeks. But the animal with chronic allergy that's prone to pyoderma in my practice typically bathing is every two weeks, and it's not typically any less than that, unless they've been cruising along for so long, they can't remember the last time they had a flare up, you know, fine, bathe once a month, but still use this antibacterial shampoo every time. So that's, that's kind of my usual approach. And whether or not antibiotics are thrown in there really depends on the degree and severity of what we've got. I kind of talk to owners when we have a chronic skin dog um, of about finding the secret sauce for their dog. Like what, like you said, back it off gradually, figure out what works for that pet to keep this from coming back. Yeah. And I also feel like I, I always ask dermatologists, like, how do I make the recurrent stuff go away? And I've yet to have somebody not say you have to find the underlying cause. So I will keep yeah. digging away there. I want there to be a simple solution, but those recurrence, there never seems to be. Well, I tell you, the other thing that, that I think is important in our thinking is that I think it's easy for us as veterinarians and certainly uh, for clients to want to look at things like allergy and certainly the secondary infections and the itching that happens. We'd like to look at that in a linear fashion, that the dog's allergic to XYZ thing, therefore it's licking, scratching, chewing, therefore it gets infections and all of that is, it is in a straight line. And so if we can stop the allergy, that it all goes away. And there was a, a great presentation at the World Congress of Veterinary Dermatology done online during COVID, but uh, the presentation done was talking about allergy in more of a, a circular or spherical approach, which really makes more sense. In the middle, you've got a dog with things like an epidermal barrier defect. Maybe now he's developed sensitivity to various pollens and allergens. Maybe there's a food allergy thrown in there too. And all those things together equal greater susceptibility. They equal itchiness on the one hand, but also greater susceptibility to infections, which also increase itchiness. They equal, you know, drier, you know, scaly skin. So all of that kind of rolls up into one. And you can't necessarily say, oh, if I just do this one thing for allergy, whether it's a drug or it's immunotherapy or whatever, that all of it will go away. Will all of the rest of it get easier? Sure. I mean, that's what we expect. That's why we do it. But to think that there's one form of therapy that's going to solve all of it, it is typically not realistic. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's, you know, it's, it's the answer that, that at least me, I, you know, hopefully I'm not alone in this need to keep hearing of, of going on that hunt and continuing to have these talks with the owners that this, this is a recurrent issue. This is something we need to get to the bottom of. And when you first said, not think of it in a linear fashion, I went, but it's so easy to think of it in a linear fashion. And Just it's a heck of a lot easier to try and explain it to somebody that way. This, you know, leads to that, which leads to the other, but it, it, it doesn't always work out that way. No. Oh, and that makes a lot of sense. I can see it in my head the way you're explaining it. Yeah. The buzzword in dermatology right now is multimodal therapy. So you've probably heard that, but multimodal therapy, your best success for managing, and it seems like we always circle back to atopy, but your best success in managing, you know, skin cases, especially with things like atopic dermatitis is multimodal therapy. Yes, we've allergy tested or doing immunotherapy, but there are also doing some regular topical therapy to manage and prevent recurrent infections. And we're managing the ears and we're doing it all together. That's true. That's true. You really, you know, you have to treat the whole dog. And right. so that makes a lot of sense. While we're on the topic of protocols here, do you want to dive into malassezia and the, these dogs that, you know, like you said, the basset hound that comes in and is just covered in yeast? Yeah, sure. So malassezia is one of those that really, even this many years later, so, uh, you know, the, the awareness that malassezia can cause issues for our dogs and their skin disease is, you know, it's been around for a while, but it still is sometimes a little bit elusive. You know, with bacterial pyodermas, because those start as the tiniest little papular pustule and they rupture and you've got crust and collarettes and you can't miss those, right? I mean, those are, are, are pretty straightforward. At malassezia doesn't always do that. And so you might get a papular rash from malassezia, or you might just get maybe a skin fold that's bright red that the dog's licking all the time. And it's tempting to assume that the 
dog's bright red because it's licking all the time. But sometimes it's bright red for another reason, and that's why it's looking all the time. So you have to be sure that, that you find that. And so managing malassezia, whether it's with you know systemic antifungals or not, topical therapies are huge. Uh, and so using, again, our usually it's a, a combination product that's going to be a myconazole chlorhexidine. There are some ketoconazole chlorhexidine products that seem to work okay as well. But those products are pretty critical in, in helping us to kind of decrease the, the yeast load and keep it clear, you know, once, once we've gotten there. The, the one caveat that I think is worth mentioning because it can absolutely make you a hero is looking for yeast in paws and claws. And, and that's where, you know, if folks aren't doing cytology in their practice on a routine basis, man, oh man, would I encourage you to start doing cytology of paws and claws. Because the difference between this chronic paw licking dog, who, oh, by the way, happens to have some nails that are a funny brown color, and finding, really being able to document that malassezia and do something about it, that will make you a hero. Because if you find a bunch of malassezia in there and you are using a, you know, your favorite conazole, ketoconazole, fluconazole, whatever, coupled with a good topical, some of those dogs stop licking their paws in three or four days. Um, and not, not that you're done treating it in three or four days, but it really can make an immediate impact. So topical therapy between the toes, armpits, groin, sometimes face folds, little lower, you know, lip folds, places like that. Absolutely huge and really, really important in managing malassezia. You are describing a patient of mine and <laughs> absolutely, as soon as he, um, he went on oral ketoconazole and he did stop stop chewing at his feet right away. I wish I could say I was the hero that did it. Um, he's got, yeah. he's got a whole lot of other skin issues Isn't as it well. Amazing? Yeah, <laughs> so. It really can make a huge difference. And I tell you, the ones with the light colored nails are, are easy, right? Cause you, you, you have to sure. go looking because sometimes the hair covers it up, but you, you know, you fold the hair back and look at the base of those nails and not only are the nails stained, but sometimes you get little crusty bits. And if you'll kind of scrape that out where the microscope slide and, and you do the old uh, diff quick stain, boy, you can find wall-to-wall -wall yeast on some of those. And those are not ones, when it's down in the claw fold, those are ones that, in my opinion, I, I feel like I always have to treat those with systemic antifungals, just because I don't feel like owners can really get all that stuff out of there and get down in that claw fold where the, the infection is really kind of sequestered. So that's a big deal. The other one to be a, a little bit aware of is, what about the dogs with dark nails? that you can't see that brown discoloration. And uh, I, I've got a, a picture of that in, uh, in a lecture that I've done on topical therapy. If you look at dark nails carefully, there is the nice shiny finish on a, on a black nail of your average German Shepherd or lab. And then you'll get some that they're shiny out on the end, but you get this dullness and this kind of irregular kind of fissure looking change about midway out on the nail. I very much believe that if that nail was white, it'd be the same brown color that we see from the discoloration. So in the dark nails, there's still a change to be seen, but you just have to pay attention and maybe be realistic about what you can and can't see from a nail that's that color. So those dogs have just as many malassezia in their paws and claws as the, as the little Bichons and poodles. They're just not as obvious. Well, Dr. Griffiths, I have to say with this whole talk, I feel like you have just left me with so many gems here that I'm just going to oh, take good. and take right back into treating patients. Like I said, I'm in Florida. I feel like we see a ton of skin dogs and I do a lot of treatment. I was like, you know, I, I feel pretty good about my topical therapy choices. And, and I, I can confirm that after this talk, I, I think I'm choosing most of my products correctly, but still so much nuance to it and so much to learn. It, it almost seems simple. Like you take the, the product and you put it on the skin, but there's there's just so much to it. And I feel like you did an excellent job of illustrating that and giving us just really practical tips that we can take back and benefit our patients. Well, great. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I am pretty passionate about topical therapy just because, you know, at, at the end of the day, if we can do things like that, that it, anymore, people are willing to do it. It used to be that clients are like, oh, I have to bathe my dog. And they didn't really look forward to that. People are willing to do it. It helps to control odor. And there is such a, a better awareness uh, and a concern for using less drugs. And so mm -hmm. if we can do something like that, that folks are going to do anyway, 
and use less medication and we have a, an overall better outcome, everybody wins. So uh, hopefully something useful in there. I think a lot of useful information. So thank you so much for joining me. Of course, thanks for having me. I hope everyone else walked away with some great practical tips for treating our dermatology patients. I know I definitely did. Dr. Griffies, thank you so much for joining me and for your wonderful explanations of how to effectively use this product. And of course, thank you to DECRA for making this episode possible. For more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.